once again i welcome all of you to this dear worship and thank you all for coming and let's continue to experience the presence of god among us and be prayerfully seated in the sanctuary and also i would request that other than those of you who need to go out in between uh, for emergency reasons others all please stay put in the sanctuary listening to the word of god and also all through the worship service as much as possible let us avoid all kinds of distractions and because we all together contribute to the uh, blessing of the worship service the presence of god when we come together so let us honor the name of the lord be respectful uh, in the uh, in the congregation and hope all of you of us will give attention to that in the coming days uh, we will turn our bibles to first kings chapter 17 verses 1 through 7 first kings 17 1 through 7 i'm going to talk about the certainty of a caring god the certainty of a caring god first kings chapter 17 verses 1 through 7 Now Elijah the Tishbite who was of the settlers of Gilead said to Ahab as the Lord God Lord the God of Israel lives before whom I stand surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word the word of the Lord came to him saying go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Cherith which is east of the jordan it shall be that you will drink of the brook and i have commanded the ravens to provide for you there so he went and he did according to the word of the lord for he went and lived by the brook of cherith which is east of the jordan the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he would drink from the brook it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land in fact i needed to read verse uh, until 16 but uh, for fear of time and also because i won't be able to cover the whole thing that i want to plan to uh, i'm planning to speak to you this uh, from this uh, won't be completed today so i just Uh, began with this uh, reading verses 1 through 7 notice the way that uh, this prophet this man of god by name elijah was uh, is introduced now elijah the tishbite from tishbe in uh, gilead of the settlers you know very very interesting way of introducing a man right a person who became so prominent in the word of god in the bible Uh, the one of the most prominent prophets of the old testament look at the way he is introduced now elijah now elijah the tishbite from tishbe in gilead of the settlers and we are not told of his parents and or other than that they named him elijah that's all what we understand meaning the word elijah means jehova is god el is jah el is jah jehova is god and uh, you know is it not interesting that god is able to make use of us uh, in spite of our unworthiness our nothingness our unknown background you know unfavorable circumstances lack of education poverty prejudices in spite of all these our god is able to use us and i really praise god for that as i usually say a uh, god specializes in using the rejects people who are rejected by the society otherwise in so many ways and you know right from the beginning of the bible that is what we see that till the end that god has taken the rejected people the isolated people the unknown people who were unknown in the society who did not even come from high stat- stature of society as status of society you know god taking them and 
using uh, them, you know. He calls and separates an idol worshipper, an idol worshipper to become the father of the nations. Abraham, you know, he was an idol worshipper. He, God calls him and separates and uses him. He chooses David, who was only a shepherd boy, to be the most famous and the most accomplished of uh, the kings of the Israelites. He chooses the hated four lepers who were so hated by everybody, the entire society in those days, and God chooses them for the deliverance of the nation of Israel from the hands of the Aramites and also from the famine and starvation that the land was going through. God chooses, you know, the tall, uneducated, simple, and... Uh, ordinary disciples to turn the world upside down. And you know, that is what we see, the, the pattern that we see in the word of God all through, right from the beginning till the end, is that God, you know, specializing in the rejects actually, taking them and using, take them, taking them in his hands and using them almost everywhere. The Bible says, in order to shame the wise, he chose the fools. In order to shame the strong, he chose the weak. And that's why we are also here. Because he chose the, you know, the fools, we are here. Because he, he chose the, the weak ones, we are also here. And I praise God for that, that we are chosen not because we were somebody, not because we were great in the eyes of the world, but God had mercy on us and he chose us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I praise God for that. And as I told you, Elijah comes as if from nowhere and becomes one of the greatest prophets as we are mentioned, as he is mentioned in the, in the Bible and the way he is introduced. His background or the parental details are not told. His public appearances are only a few times in the Bible, but he becomes one of the greatest uh, prophets of God as mentioned in the Bible. He is paired with Moses. It's again interesting that he is paired with Moses and brought uh, in the New Testament and he was uh, also expected to come and set everything right as we are told in the word of God. Another interesting thing that before I get into my, the, the, the main crux of my message, main part of my message, another interesting thing is that Elijah was cared for by God especially more than anybody else. He was cared for by God. He was really being cared for by God. Elijah was a servant of God who was totally cared for by God. We are not told how his parents cared for him, but we are told how God cared for him. We find ravens feeding him. We find a, find a widow uh, feeding him. We find angels feeding him and caring for him. So God employs, God employs, you know, different means, different methods to feed his Seven. So, in in total, in 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 a summary form, God cared for Elijah especially. And you know, it's interesting again that God has a budget for everybody, right? In His universe, He has budgeted, you know, uh, resources for everybody. How many of us work with a budget? You know, I'm not talking about your office work, but in your family affairs, uh, you know, how do you work? You know, uh, how many of us work with a budget? In the beginning of the year, you make a budget for yourself that these are the expenses that I'm going to have. These are the, uh, this is the source of income that I have. Uh, some of your accountants are talking about it already. Uh, you know, so we work with budgets, right? In our families and in our individual lives, we work with budget and it's not interesting. Some eventualities come, some unforeseen situations come and uh, then sometimes we have to have some contingency plans, you know, in the budget, uh, uh, you know, many a times. But interesting that God has a budget for everybody. I'm, I'm really happy that God has a budget for me also. Uh, God has a budget for everyone who is seated here. He has budgeted things for us, for our life. And, you know, that means not only that God has a budget for us, but God also has worked out the menu already, the menu what we'll be eating, what we'll be drinking, how our needs will be met, how we are going to fare. Everything is already worked out. He has all the provisions for your life too. The steps of a righteous man 
are all ordered by the Lord, ordained by the Lord. And he has already made plans and provisions for you as you are found working in his way. That's why I want to talk about the certainty of a caring God. Okay, in this message we have two parts actually. The first part is talking about uh, main two sections in this passage and also I'll be talking about. One is the uncertainty of the world's resources. The uncertainty of the world's resources. If you have pinned your hope, put your trust on the resources of the world, be it known to every one of us that the, the, the world's resources are so uncertain. Uncertain. The world's resources. And we are told in verse 7 that it, appear, it happened after a while that the brook dried up. The brook of Cherith, where he was hiding, it dried up because there was no rain in the land. So the brook from which Elijah was drinking, used to drink, he was directed by God, he was commanded by God, go eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Cherith. And he was hiding himself. And he was drinking from that uh, 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 brook and in the morning, uh, you know, ravens will come, uh, you know, with meat and also bread. And, um, but in no time, and in the evening also the ravens will come and he was being fed from, uh, by the ravens as well as drinking from the brook. And we read there, um, the brook dried up because there was no rain, no water. We see death in the area, we see dying, a, a drying brook drying of the river, we see death, we see shortage of food, we see a desperate situation. Just want to tell all of you this morning, every brook in the world can dry up. Every brook. Every source of this world can dry up and finish off. Finish off. Nothing is certain in this world. Nothing. Nothing else is certain in this world. Riches, riches or affluence is not certain. I don't know how many of us are thinking that our riches will always, you know, that will keep abounding. Our riches will go for all the time. We will have riches and, uh, and uh, so much of money and affluence for all the time. So riches or affluence is not certain. James says, that's why we read in the Bible where James uh, uh, writes that do not put your trust in the uncertain riches of the world. Uncertain riches. Riches is? Riches is? Uncertain. Say it loudly. Riches is? Uncertain. If you put your trust on the riches, the money, the bank account, your affluence, your resources, be it known to us this morning, riches is uncertain, uncertain affluence of this world. The book of Proverbs says about wealth that it flies away. It flies away. When you least expect that, when you think that it is going to be there for all the time, for your generation as well as for the generations to come, it is going to supply and stand, be there for the pedigree, the, the generations to come. The Bible says that it will just fly away. It could just fly away. And how many people who put their trust on riches were ashamed and realized very late that riches won't sustain them in a world of uncertainties. There is an interesting song in Malayalam which we learned back in the schools earlier. Maliga Mughal area mananda tholil marap getunnadum bhavan. In two or four days, it is God who, it is God alone, it is God who gives, uh, you know, stature or affluence or resources to a person in two or four days, in a few days. And in the same way, a person who is, you know, dwelling in a big mansion and with all the affluence, it is the same God who gives him a, a begging bag on his back in no time, in no time. It's so uncertain 
the things many a times that we put our trust on are so uncertain. How unfortunate that many of the people who call themselves also as children of God, as believers also put their trust on these things and thinking that this will stay forever. Hallelujah. The riches of this world is so uncertain. Life, and life itself is so uncertain, right? Bible says, do not trust mere man who has but a breath in his nostrils. Do not trust him. He only has a breath in his nostrils. That's all. You don't know when that breath will be gone. What is the meaning? The meaning is that it's only a breath. You are not sure. The breath that you take in, will, will you be able to breathe it out? You're not sure. A breath of air or a drop of water could kill a person. A breath of air. We are so uncertain. We are so fragile. We are such limited people, such weak and feeble people. Why do we show that we are somebody? I have the strength. I'm able to manage things. I don't hear anybody. In the I work according to my, the dictates of my own conscience. I don't listen to anybody else's. We may not say it, but that is what we think many a times, right? Our life is so uncertain. And that is why James says that I, our life is only a vapor. Vapor. That this moment you see that, Next moment it disappears. Everything in this world is so uncertain. Our health is so uncertain. We are hearing about that again and again. And the Bible says even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall be exhausted. Yavana car? Even the young man, young man, the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall be exhausted. The health of health of your spouse, health of a family member, or your own health might fail. Might fail. None of us is sure. How long? We'll be healthy like this. How long we'll be able to come to the sanctuary to worship the Lord? None of us is sure. None of us is sure what is going to happen tomorrow. A job is so uncertain, right? The job that we are doing, the employer could say at any time you are fired. And the supporters will say no more. Anything could happen in this world. Nothing is certain in this world. Your fame and recognition is so uncertain. People who praise you today, people who speak so high of you today, could deride you, to cur would, would curse you tomorrow. They will put you down, tremble on you, and would just curse you, could, could curse you tomorrow. Nothing is certain. Everything as we see in this world, for those who put their trust on the things of this world, the temporal things of this world, it is a deception. It is a vanity as the Bible says it. People often wonder about the charm and the deceptive vain glory of the celebrities, right? And feel and say that, oh, if at all living, we should live like so and so. Should live like Mohanlal. Or Mamuti. I don't know the names of the film stars here, the main ones. Whether you say it or not, you might 
think and desire that if at all I could live like one of them. Because you think that they are enjoying the life. You think that they are celebrating, right? But realities could be very, very different. They may be seen celebrating and enjoying outside, but inside they may be walking volcanoes. Potam bohun ne akni parvadam bohle. Ullag atte gari kum pala rede. Paramen un nokum bhanda ganne. They are celebrating. They are celebrating. There may not be peace in their families, in their individual lives. As we heard this morning from the psalm, Samadhana Thode Kadanurangan, Patta Thode. Must have heard about uh, Merlin Monroe, right? One of the most famous of the actresses. Very beautiful lady, as people say, who could enter into the White House, and when the world leaders met there in White House, it was she who was invited to conduct a dance. And she danced before the world leaders, and the leaders all clapped and said, oh, beautiful, beautiful lady, beautiful dance, and beautiful performance. And everyone must have said, if at all living, should live like Merlin Monroe. She gets out, for a, even for a shopping, hundreds of people would come around her. Enough money, everything. But very soon she committed suicide. And the suicide note said, I'm bored of this life. Bored of this life. The charm, the appearances, what you see outside, it is so deceptive. Do not ever put your trust on any of these things. I'm not simply being otherworldly and not saying that we should not have uh, riches, we should not be doing job, we should not have money. That's not my point. But even when God blesses you with these things or when you get all these things, do not ever put your trust on these things. One main entertainer Maybe it was Charlie Chaplin or somebody else like that who had a real mental problem, depression-like uh, symptom and he went to a psychiatrist who did not know him and the psychiatrist said, you need to laugh. You need to laugh. And so how can I laugh? My inside is burning. How can I laugh? He said, well, Charlie Chaplin is conducting a show here somewhere nearby. Why don't you go and attend that? He said, sir, I am Charlie Chaplin. I may be making others to laugh, but I fail to laugh inside. That is the situation of the people around. They may be seen laughing, but inside is burning. Inside is burning. No peace, no joy. Because the world around cannot, cannot provide us with joy. Years back, the industrial revolution came. Yosai Viplo. And people thought that was it. That was it. At last, prosperity is here. Now we have all this technological advancement and all this machine. We, have, we are entering into a machine age and we have everything at our disposal. So now hereafter, our, our life will be prosperous and huge buildings started coming up everywhere and people started investing in everything and they thought that peace is here for, for to stay for all the time and they are good. But in no time, Second World War came. And you know what happened as a result of that, right? When they even were prospering, when they were amassing wealth and accumulating all these resources, they said, we don't need God anymore. They even claimed and said, we have killed God and we are standing, science has killed God and science is standing on the dead body of God. That's what the claim they made. But you know what happened, right? Second World War. All this concept 
all their aspirations, their aspirations about prosperity and affluence. Everything was gone. And nuclear bombs were dropped in Japan and many hundred thousands and millions of people were killed and death and destruction everywhere. The peace was lost. The advancement was over. Everything was lost and they found that they could not put their trust on things as we see around. Just I want to tell you that if you have put your hope on any of these things, any of these things, very quickly, you will have to say, in vain, in vain, I ran after all these things. I ran after all these things. I worked in vain for all these things. Had I given priority to the Lord, to his kingdom, that would have lasted for ever. Amen. What are you pinning your hopes on this morning? Where is your hope? Let me ask every one of you. Where is your hope? The uncertain riches, uncertain affluence, uncertain everything, as you see by your naked eyes, is that what your hope is pinned on? These are so uncertain as this word says, the brook of Cherith dried up. Every brook, every brook in this world will dry up. If you put your trust on those. It may be a very late realization. If you realize that now and put your priorities in place, you will be a wise man. If your priorities are in place, you will be a wise person. If not, you will also one day see that. Well, the brook is dried up. But then, don't get too disheartened. There is a source that will never, ever dry up. There is a source that will never, ever dry up. And I want to talk about that. The certainty of God's resources. Every other resource was drying up. Even the king came out, you know, King Ahab. We read about him in the word of God. He came out looking for grass for his donkeys. What a pitiable state, right? Raja Vipayandu Varkyanana He was looking for grass for his animals. That was the pitiable situation in the land. And it was such a situation. But God took care of his servant in the best possible way. In the best way. So when we talk about the certainty of God's resources, how much does God provide? That's all what we have time to think about today. How much does God provide? At the brook of Cherith, Elijah was drinking from the brook and ravens feeding him with meat and bread both in the morning and evenings. Can you imagine that sight? I used to think that one raven used to come in the morning in the beak, one or two bread crumbs and a small meat portion and feed Elijah, give it to Elijah and go back. No. It is written, ravens would come. Ravens would come. Many ravens would come. Imagine that sight of the ravens flying and several of them will have Bread in their beak. And meat followed by other ravens with meat pieces. Steaks, right? Maybe from the palace of Ahab. You know that ravens are good in stealing. They always have this habit of stealing. If a, a small boy or a child is outside with a food, a, you know, some kind of food in his hand, the ravens will be coming surrounding and if all the people are not around, will suddenly come and steal that food and go. So we don't know where these ravens stole that from. I'm sure God did not send it from his kitchen, but it must have been taken from somewhere nearby and the most probable place, I assume that was 
the palace of Ahab, right? He got into the kitchen of the king and these ravens got into the kitchen of the king and suddenly they would steal away all these bread crumbs, bread pieces and the meat steaks and bring it to Elijah. Flying to the place where Elijah hid by the brook. Some with bread, some with meat. Everywhere else was famine. But God's servant is provided with what he needed. And that also abundantly, abundantly. Every day morning, bread and meat. Evening, bread and meat. What a sumptuous, luxurious kind of meal, right? Those days, I remember my childhood days and the, uh, it, it would be very seldom that we would buy meat at home. And the day we buy meat will be a celebration, right? Those days. We're not like these days. For many people, me, buying meat and fish and everything was something not frequently happening in the families. Because we were all very poor, very poor, living very poor lives. Most of us, most of us. But then, imagine Elijah. When there is famine in all of the places, Elijah had plenty, plenty of meat, plenty of bread every, every day. And the wonderful thing about trusting God, about the certainty of God's provision, is that he provides sufficient for your needs. He provides sufficient for your needs. God is so generous in his giving. God doesn't give like a beggar. When God gives, he gives like God. He is concerned about his name. He is, he is zealous about the honor of his name and he wouldn't give in a way that would belittle his name. Are you with me? That's why God's word says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Hallelujah. Can we really trust him? Because it is the promise of God's word. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Hallelujah. The provisions are many a times are beyond our asking. Beyond even our wildest imaginations, comprehensions at times. I did not comprehend the world. I did not even imagine the way God would bless me. He proved himself. He proved his faithfulness again and again, repeatedly in my life. I know I can trust him. Jacob says, as we read in the Old Testament, did I not cross this Jordan with one staff in my hand? Did I not cross this Jordan with one staff in my hand? But now, after 20 years, you have made me into two companies of people and possessions. Two companies of people and possessions. All the cattle, all the possessions. That's what God can do. When you trust in, in the certainty of a caring God. I'm sure many of us, I have heard several people saying when I came to the U.S., I only one, I had one small suitcase in my hand with maybe $10, $6. I heard several people saying so many things, you know, about the faithfulness of a caring God. Now, I'm not in any way boasting about the possessions or anything, but just talking about the faithfulness of God, the certainty of a caring God. David says, I am so undeserving of all the mercies you have shown to me. Look back. You will also be able to say, Lord, 
am so undeserving. Why should you bless me like this? Why should you provide for my needs like this? Who am I, O oh Lord? That you have such mercy, shown such mercy in my life. Lord, who am I? Kartave Nyanara, Nyanum Enoda, Ni Kanichrikina De Kyokka Nyan, Apatra Matre, Apatra Matre. I'm so undeserving. That is what David says. Look back. That is what you will see if you are a grateful person. Nani Ole Alanaki. Why did you bless me like this? Why did you brought, bring me up to this point? Israelites must have asked this. I look at the provision of manna. I look at the provision of the quails. I look that, at the provision of the water as we travel through the deserts. You know, 40 long years, almost two and a half million of them or more of, more of them. Two and a half million of them being provided daily with manna. Manna was falling thick and heavy everywhere, all around them. And two and a half million of them could collect two liters of manna per day. That means two and a half million means, you know, how many liters of manna falling every day? Uh, five? Five million liters of manna falling around them. Every day, not for one day or 10 days or even 10 years, for 40 long years. Which human government could have done that? Which human government could have provided them with such supply, with such amount of manna every day? But God so simply, so easily, you know, uh, made his manna to fall for them every day. They just needed to go out and collect them. And use that as food. Quails, the tastiest meat. That's what I'm told of. I mean, I have eaten also. Tastiest meat of that people think can think of was provided for them. You know, and the quails will come. They usually have such a, a, a flying habit. You know, in no time they can just shoot uh, and go up in the air without any difficulty, in a, in a fraction of a second, they will just fly up. But those quails will come and fly so low and stay there until they go out and catch them. As if they, they, they have come and are saying, enne pidichu, enne pidichu. They are just staying there because they are at the command of the Lord. They are here and they have seen this, how the Lord provided for them. Water gushing out of the rock. Not only that water came out of the rock, but started this water following them all the way. All the way. Can you imagine? All the way through the desert. Look at the faithfulness of God. Where there could not be water, there could not be a, a, a river, there could not be a well, but God supplying super abundantly. Super abundantly, how much can God provide for them? That's why Jesus said, Ask of me, I shall give you little by little. Right? I shall give you little by little. Is that what the Lord said? No. Thank you for disagreeing. What did the Lord say? Ask of me. I shall give you. Until your joy is full. How many of us can say my joy is full? I won't believe you even if you say. Because our joy is not full. Because we have not asked the Lord for whatever he can do for us. Whatever he has in store for us, we have not asked him. Hallelujah. Our God is a God who can give so generously, super abundantly, super abundantly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our trust is not on anything that the world can offer us. Our trust is only on God. Only on God. 
and he can give us super abundantly. Our material needs can be provided by him. Our earthly needs can be provided and met by him. Our spiritual needs can be met by him. Why should we, instead of trusting him, why should we trust on the things of this world? We can ask our God, right? We can our God, ask our God, why should we be ashamed by asking the people, why should we put our trust on mere men? Shall we close our eyes and bow our heads in the presence of God? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The certainty of a caring God. I'm sure he must have told several of you. I'm sure several of you must have heard the voice of the Lord saying to you, son, daughter, trust in me, trust in me, trust in me, trust in me. Instead of the many things that you are trusting today, trust in me. I know I the instances where I displaced the Lord, but by not fully trusting on the Lord. Instances where I put my trust on people. Instances where I even asked for help from people, but where I became so ashamed, so ashamed that I ever put my trust on people ever put my trust on the things around. But I'm glad that I was learning through that. I was learning through those instances. Now I know I can only trust. Trust my God. And I can fully trust him without an iota of doubt. I can trust him fully trust him. How many of you want to do that? How many of you want to say that I don't want to put my trust on anything else? I am fully putting my trust on the Lord. Make a decision this morning. Father, we come to you. We confess the fact that many a times we put our trust on the things of this world, the uncertain things of this world. We are sorry for that. We many times thought that this would be lasting forever. But how foolish we became. We are sorry for that. We are your people. And you have a budget for every one of us. You have planned out everything. Every detail for our life. All the needs you have planned for it. All the situations that we are going through today you have planned for it. And we also know the fact that we can fully trust you. So Lord, we repose our trust on you completely. Come to you. Help us. Help us that we may never waver, O oh Lord. But we'll always be trusting you and you alone. And also that we will be ashamed of asking for help from people instead of trusting you. Help us, I pray. Open our eyes to your provisions and be people who totally stand trusting you. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.